Did the God of Israel lose to another God? In 2 Kings 3, we read Israel's vassal kingdom of Moab rebelled. Elisha the prophet said the Lord would give the Moabites into Israel's hand. At first, everything seemed to suggest that Israel would be victorious. But at the end of the chapter, we read that Mesha, king of Moab, sacrificed his firstborn son, and then great wrath came against Israel. This caused Israel to withdraw and return to their own land without conquering Moab. The Hebrew word for wrath usually refers to the wrath of God, which suggests the chapter is saying the wrath that came against Israel was of divine origin. But why would it have come from the Lord, who was supposed to be on Israel's side? So many skeptics argue the wrath came from the god of Moab, Chemosh, who was appeased by Mesha's sacrifice and unleashed his power against the Israelite army. So the Lord's promise that Israel would conquer Moab was not fulfilled, thus meaning Israel and their god were defeated by a rival deity. But is this really what the text says? Is a biblical author, who believed no god could rival the Lord, really admitting another god could beat their own? Or is there something we're missing in the biblical and cultural context that demonstrates we have misunderstood this passage? The ending of 2 Kings 3 is brief, but because of this, interpretations abound. Some argue the wrath was not divine, but from the Moabites, who after seeing their prince sacrificed, attacked Israel with such fury they managed to turn the tide of the battle. Other scholars say the wrath came from the god Chemosh, and others say it came from the Lord. Because of this, we need to do our best to study the biblical and cultural context to hopefully provide some answers on what is going on in this brief passage. The first thing we need to cover is the bias of the authors of Kings. The Book of Kings was not written by Moabites or modern atheists, but devotees of the Lord who claimed that he alone was God over all the earth. There were none like him. This hardly suggests the authors of 1st and 2nd Kings would have entertained the possibility that what they call the abomination of Moab could have ever defeated their God. So it's unlikely that is what they were intending to narrate. The scholar Drew Holland says, it'd be out of character for the biblical text to attribute such power to a foreign deity. The prophetic narratives of kings refuse to view any foreign deity as effectual. This view is most evident in a preceding narrative, 1 Kings 18, 20 to 40, in which Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal. The climax of this passage comes in the confession of the people that the Lord is God, as opposed to Baal. Not only would the author of 2 Kings 3, who falls in the same prophetic tradition, if not the same author of both passages, omit Chemosh as the subject of this passage, but he would never consider Chemosh powerful enough to influence the Israelite soldiers. Only the Lord has this ability for the author of Kings. Furthermore, it can be challenged that the authors actually believe the Lord was supporting the northern kingdom of Israel in this endeavor. The authors of Kings regularly write negatively about the northern kingdom and its kings. 2 Kings 3 is likely another chapter where God is actually in opposition to the kingdom. Peter J. Lightheart points out the text speaks of the Israelite army violating the covenant stipulations from Deuteronomy, which would have angered the Lord. But also, the text contains Exodus themes and motifs to signify Moab's exodus from Israel's control. But it is a perverted Exodus, being that neither side is painted in a good light. An exodus is occurring, so the story is written to parallel Israel's exodus, but God takes neither side, and this is because Israel is violating the stipulations of her covenant with God. First, Deuteronomy says that God told Israel to leave Moab alone. Verse 2.9 says, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar to the people of Lot for a possession. Lightheart says it's unlikely they were supposed to be ruling over Moab as a vassal state, or to make war against them. Additionally, Deuteronomy 20 says, When you besiege a city for a long time, making war against it in order to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. You may eat from them, but you shall not cut them down. Are the trees in the field human, that they should be besieged by you? 
Only the trees that you know are not trees for food. You may destroy and cut down. That you may build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it falls. Yet in 2 Kings 3, it says the army felled all the good trees, which is a direct violation of the covenant laid out in Deuteronomy. Lightheart says, The Lord's great wrath burns against Israel because they conduct their war in flagrant disregard of his laws. Also, as noted, the authors seem to be writing in a way to parallel the account of the exodus from Egypt. But neither side is in the right, and it plays out as a perverted exodus. First, God miraculously provides water for Israel, as he did when they left Egypt. There is a song like the Song of Moses in that Elisha gives his prophecy while a musician plays. The water leads to the destruction of the Moabite army, like the waters of the Reed Sea destroy the Egyptian army. The Moabites believe the water is filled with blood, reminiscent of the first plague of Egypt. There is a death of the firstborn, reminiscent of the final plague. Moab's exodus is led by Mesha, whose name might be a Hebrew pun of two names, Moses and Joshua merged. This shows us the authors are very aware of the exodus narrative and write the account in a way to parallel their own history of the exodus from Egypt. However, this also signifies God is in control over the situation, like he was during the exodus. No god of Egypt was able to challenge or rival the power of the Lord which suggests the same theme is playing out in 2 Kings 3. The only god who is active here is the Lord of Israel, which is why Chemosh, the god of Moab, is not even mentioned. A key section of this chapter is the prophecy of Elisha. Joe M. Sprinkle and Peter Lightheart note Elisha's prophecy is a prediction and nothing more. It is not a command for Israel to besiege the cities or destroy the trees. Elisha's prediction is a prediction and nothing more. Further, Elisha's prophecy is certainly incomplete. The Lord gives Moab into the hand of Israel, as Elisha predicts. But Elisha does not finish the story, and that incompleteness, like the prophecies of the false prophets in 1 Kings 22, sets a trap for Jehoram. In other words, Elisha merely predicts what will happen, but doesn't command them to violate the stipulations of the Torah. The authors also suggest Elisha did not approve of this campaign, given his reluctancy to help which explains why Elisha doesn't do anything other than predict some of the events that will occur. But some argue the prophecy fails, because Moab is not delivered into Israel's hand at the end. But Raymond Westbrook and George Harton challenge this assumption and suggest the prophecy was fulfilled specific to what Elisha spoke and nothing more. First, the line about God giving the Moabites in Israel's hand is presented before Israel begins laying siege to the fortified cities. The line therefore refers to the battle that took place close to the water that came out of Adam. The Moabites were given into Israel's hand there, and before they began besieging the cities. Within the next section of the prophecy, we should note a few things. It is likely that Elisha viewed Jehoram, the king of Israel's, campaign unfavorably. Westbrook says, Elisha's prophecy was fulfilled to the letter, given Elisha's patent hostility to King Jehoram. It is not surprising that he wished to see Israel's campaign fail. He did not, however, offer a deliberately false prophecy. Elisha made a true prophecy. It was the misfortune or misguidedness of King Jehoram that he failed to interpret the words of the prophecy correctly. Westbrook notes Elisha uses a specific verb that refers to striking the fortified cities, but this does not necessarily carry the connotations they will fully conquer every city. So Elisha's prophecy ends ambiguously, and likely on purpose, being that the text suggests he did not approve of this campaign. Elisha merely states they will strike every fortified city, but doesn't go so far as to say they will fully subdue Moab. However, Drew Holland responds to Westbrook and argues Moab did briefly fall back in Israel's hands and submitted to their rule. Elisha's prophecy did come true. But at the very moment Moab fell back in Israel's hands, the northern kingdom failed the god who led them to reclaim their rebellious vassal when they participated with Mesha in his illicit sacrifice. He draws attention to verse 25 and 26. In verse 25, it says Israel attacked the city, but the Hebrew word used here when talking about a city typically refers to the destruction or conquering of it, suggesting that the Israelites did conquer the capital of Moab. The authors then tell us the king of Moab attempted to break through with 700 swordsmen, but could not. 
Thus, Mesha knew he was defeated and could not escape, so he had no choice but to accept Israel's rule. But a common interpretation is that Mesha did not actually surrender yet, but made one final desperate plea to appease his god Chemosh. He sacrificed his firstborn son in hopes that Chemosh would turn the tide of the battle. But this interpretation may be a misunderstanding on our part. The cultural and biblical context does not support the understanding that Mesha did this to turn the tide of the battle, but actually sacrificed his son after he knew he was defeated as an act of repentance for breaking his oath to Israel. Raymond Westbrook reminds us that before Mesha rebelled, he would have been bound to Israel by an oath he likely made to his god Chemosh. So he would have been expected to face punishment from his god if he broke his oath. Thus Westbrook says, In sacrificing his son, Mesha was expiating his sin to his own god for breach of the oath. The action of King Mesha in 2 Kings 3.27 suggests that he also had offered the besiegers a compromise. He sacrificed his firstborn in their full view, thus demonstrating his contrition before his god and his willingness to abide by the treaty. In other words, Mesha was not sacrificing his son as an attempt to win a final victory over Israel. His sacrifice was therefore an act of repentance. Within the culture of the Southern Levant, sacrifices were often performed at the end of a battle, either to give thanks to a god for victory or to atone for the sins that led to a defeat. We see similar examples in other biblical texts. In Judges 20.26, we see Israelites made burnt offerings to God at Bethel after losing to the Benjaminites, which appears to be an act of atonement for defeat. In 2 Kings 16, King Ahaz accepts he cannot win against the king of Syria, so he appeals to the king of Assyria for aid. To signify his vassal status and submission, he has the high priest offer burnt offerings to signify the deal. In 2 Kings 18 and 19, which Westbrook says is a close parallel to 2 Kings 3, the Assyrian king marches against the rebels in Judah and captures all the fortified cities, leaving only Jerusalem. King Hezekiah shows repentance and says, I have done wrong, and attempts to offer propitiation. Likewise, Westbrook says that was Mesha's aim in 2 Kings 3, to accept he acted wrongly and make amends in his own way. Westbrook also cites Micah 6 7, which says, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Drew Holland says, These examples provide further context for Mesha's motivation to offer the burnt offering. The burnt offering was commonly sacrificed in a wartime situation by battle losers to express apology, and it was also done by vassal kings to solidify a relationship with a suzerain king. Both types fit Mesha in 2 Kings 3 the rebellious vassal wishing to re-establish his relationship with his suzerain after defeat. Holland also notes when such a sacrifice was performed, the suzerain was likely present and a willing participant at the ceremony, like what we see with the Assyrian king in 2 Kings 16, which means the suzerain would actually be partaking in the sacrifice. Given this, when we read 2 Kings 3, Israel and Jehoram would have been participants in Mesha's sacrifice of his firstborn, something that was an abomination to the Lord, and would explain why divine wrath came against them. The sacrifice also served a practical function for Israel, being that Mesha's successor would not be able to seek vengeance against the Israelites. The firstborn son was also seen as a worthy substitute for the father, so the Moabite prince functioned as a substitute for his father's sin. John D. Levinson writes, The variety of child sacrifice is to be associated with the ancient notion that, in certain circumstances, the king himself must be offered. The son is here but a substitute for the father. Mesha sinned against Israel, and to atone for his sin, he offered up his son as a substitute for his breach of his oath. But this also means Israel was acting as a willing participant in this abominable practice. Holland says, Nowhere in the biblical text do we find the burnt offering functioning as the means by which one would appropriately provoke a deity for military victory assistance. Rather, the burnt offering is only intended to be undertaken after a battle is complete. If one loses the battle, the burnt offering has repentant force. If one wins the battle, the burnt offering has celebratory intentions. The significance attached to the burnt offering affirms not only the rationale for Mesha's sacrifice, but also the point of the prior section that the battle at Kir Harsus 
was complete and that Israel had won, fulfilling Elisha's prophecy. Westbrook argues the wrath came from Chemosh. Mesha had submitted, signified by his sacrifice, but Jehoram and Israel kept attacking regardless. This resulted in Chemosh protecting Moab with his divine wrath. But on this interpretation, the Lord was not defeated, since he did deliver Moab into Israel's hand. Israel decided to go one step further, acting beyond what the Lord had granted, and ended up incurring the wrath of Chemosh. But Drew Holland thinks this is unlikely to be what the authors meant, given their worldview and their belief in the supremacy of the Lord. The text doesn't say who this sacrifice was made to, so both groups could have had their own specific gods in mind. This means that the recipient of Mesha's sacrifice was not strictly Chemosh, Rather, even if the Moabites and Israelites had their respective gods in mind while sacrificing, the net result of their deed was a worshipful action directed to an unknown god. The text reflects this syncretistic situation in its ambiguity. Thus, the conclusion of the chapter results in a breaking point, where Israel goes too far by participating in a human sacrifice that involves syncretism with the God of Israel. The Lord turns on them, unleashing his wrath, and drives them out of Moab entirely. Up until the final verse, the themes of the Exodus throughout the chapter support a victory for Israel. All the Exodus motifs suggest Moab is a villain and Israel will win. But then at the end of the narrative, it all reverses, and Moab is led into their Exodus by a Moses figure. And the reason seems to be because Israel acted sinfully throughout the chapter, resulting in the Lord turning on them. Their final sin of accepting Mesha's abominable sacrifice was the last straw for God, and he turned on Israel unleashing his wrath, and thereby forcing them to flee back to their own land. And this is another theme we find in Deuteronomy. Verse 29-27 says that God will pour out great wrath on Israel for disobedience, and one punishment will be exile from the land. In 2 Kings 3, Israel's sin of human sacrifice results in God's great wrath, driving them from the land of Moab. The Moabites may very well have thought it was Chemos driving Israel away. But the authors of Kings use themes from Deuteronomy and Exodus to argue the wrath came from the Lord, resulting in Israel being exiled from Moab. In conclusion, it is very unlikely the text is stating Chemosh scored a victory over the Lord. It doesn't explicitly say this, and such an interpretation is unlikely, given the worldview of the authors. Seems more likely we see a common narrative playing out. Israel, led by corrupt kings, commits sinful acts that violate the Torah. Despite this, God is patient and merciful, and fights for them, delivering Moab into their hands. But then Israel goes too far, and accepts Mesha's human sacrifice. This is the final straw, and it kindles the Lord's anger against them. He unleashes his divine wrath, and exiles them from the land of Moab. Chemosh is not an active player in this narrative, because the authors did not consider him to have any real power. So once we dive into the cultural and biblical context, There is no reason to think the authors would ever write this account in a way that suggested another deity could rival their one true God. The text therefore indicates the Lord poured out his divine wrath on Israel because of their great sin.